Hey everyone, uh, today I want to welcome Jake Dunlap to my expert interview series. Jake is the founder of Scale Consulting and a former sales leader at No Wait, which was acquired by Yelp, Chartbeat, Glassdoor, and Career Builder. Uh, he's appeared in Forbes and the Huffington Post and was a guest on the Gary V Audio Experience, just to name a few. Jake, Jake is a top voice on the future of sales and the host of a highly rated podcast conveniently titled The Jake Dunlap Show. Welcome, Jake. Thank you for taking the time. Awesome. I'm looking forward to the conversation. It should be fun. Yes. I've got a number of questions. If you're ready, we can jump right in. I love it, man. Let's do it. All right. So my first question is this. According to RepView data, most tech companies are coming in below quota in 2021. Mm -hmm. In fact, I've seen a, a poll that you've done, which said about 71% of outbound teams are missing their numbers this year. So what do you think are some of the reasons that sales teams are missing quota right now? Yeah, I mean, I think it's easy to point to some of the, I guess, environmental challenges, right? You know, the economy's in flux. 20, I mean, you think about 2020 to 2021, we went from being, you know, nervous and afraid to all of a sudden, you know, 2021 was crazy. The money was flowing. You know, everyone was hitting numbers. Companies were growing and scaling. They had all this pent up, you know, uh, demand. And, you know, we saw a correction, you know, in the middle of 2022. And so there certainly are some economic conditions that definitely are affecting certain industries. You know, what I always try to say, though, is like, look, I can't affect that. You know, if I'm a rep or if I'm running a sales org, I can't affect that. And so, um, you know, I, I built, you know, my first sales org uh, at CareerBuilder, like you mentioned, in 2007, 2008, 2009. I mean, yeah, like, and we were the largest job site at the time. And that's, you know, the financial meltdown. And, you know, people were like, yeah, we're not really hiring. But my team was the top performing team for two years in a row, 2008, 2009, um, because of that. And because we were able to instead pivot to really understand our buyer and understand what they were going through, understand the challenges that they had, that they were still hiring, but we just needed to be really smart experts in their industry. And so I, I really feel like, you know, kind of to bring it full circle, the reason teams are struggling today is we got all these tools and we're using it to do more bulk activity versus more quality activity. And that's kind of the crazy part here is that these tools were designed to actually say, hey, you know what, Jake, you don't need to remember who to follow up with in two days or five days, these sequencing tools. Um, you know, you're going to have like a little thing to already start with, which I'm like, gosh, I wish I would have had that, you know, 10 plus years ago. And and instead, we're, we're just hitting, we're trying to go for more as the metric, more volume, higher volume, and we should be focused on higher quality. And I, and I, and I think we're going to start to see a, a, a focus there, but I think it used to be, candidly, you could kind of outwork the problem, you know, like you could, but there's so much more competition. Email is just inundated and, pe you know, people's inboxes are just destroyed, um, which wasn't the case three, four, five years ago. And so more worked because you could still cut through the noise. But now, in, you know, to, looking at 2023, you know, your, the quality, the cleverness and the relevancy that you reach out to is, is are those are the teams that are going to win. And so I think we put ourselves here by um, continuing to push the same buttons that worked years and years ago and expecting the same result. And now we have buyers that are more inundated than ever um, with messaging that's less customized and less relevant than ever. I want to dig in a little bit more there and get your view on exactly how buying has changed in the last couple of years. I've heard you, uh, you know, post about this um, and, and and give some specific opinions, and I wonder if you can give those here. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, for a lot of people, all you really need to do is just look at your consumer buying behaviors. Um, you know, if I told you four years ago, five years ago, probably four years ago, hey. You're going to be able to have anything that you want, click to buy and ship to your house tomorrow. You'd be like, oh, that'd be, that'd be helpful. Like, that'd be good. And now it's like, you know, if you're on Amazon and something's going to take like three days to get there or like a slightly inferior item, but pretty much the same is going to get there tomorrow. How many of you picked the latter? All of you, right? And, and what's happened is that we are so used to convenience, very little friction, not talking to people. I saw a stat. I don't know what it was for last year. This is a couple of years ago. There's something like 70% of homes were found by the buyer, right? Like people didn't want to talk to an agent. They're like, like I'm going to go do my own research. And then when it's time, I'm going to reach out to somebody. And then, and then you had the pandemic where prior to the pandemic, people said, oh, 
people will never buy enterprise software remote. You have to be face to face. Like, nope, they did it. 2021 happened. And so what's happened is again, I'll go back to similar to what I said before. There's a lot of these legacy behaviors in sales that were true and were very true. You know, buyers didn't have as like as, as much access to information, right? So they couldn't research your company. I had to get it from a salesperson. Um, I hadn't been trained in my consumer behavior to want a self-guided click to buy journey. Well, that's what happens now, you know, and, and I tell the story and it'll kind of get to like where I think we need to head. You know, I tell this, this is literally like literally a year ago, like identical time. Um, we were trying to prepay some expenses for, for the next year. And I reach out to sales, Salesforce rep, you know, we weren't a big customer, like $40,000 contract, something like that. Um, I say, Hey man, um, who's our rep. Okay. That took two or three days. I'm like, gee, okay. Finally, I get it. Hey Jake, let's hop on a call. No, I do not want to, please. I, I do not want to hop on a call at all. Um, send me the contract. Okay. Yeah, Jake, I can do that, but I want to understand. Stop. <laughs> send me. Why can't I? And then he sent, I swear to you, they sent me a PDF to enter my credit card. I'm like, this is what Salesforce is doing. I can't, I can't just give you my, I can't just run my credit card self-service or 40 K. And then I was like, and I'll catch up with you in January, but I want to, I need to get this done. And then we'll talk about my business later. And I did catch up with a guy, but, but we need, we have to realize people are coming in at various levels of intent and, and, uh, you know, uh, intent to buy um, uh, education level that just didn't exist years ago. And so if your process is linear today, it's like, we do a call, we do a qualification call, we do this, and you're not understanding where people are in the intent process. Because Bant, Medic, and a lot of these, they actually don't help you to understand that. They help you to get a sense for like the ecosystem, but, and maybe like, you know, there's some things in there like budget identification, et cetera. But the reality is these, these frameworks weren't set up to say, oh, Jake actually is here. Oh, we just need to put together a proposal I need to loop in three people. He does. And we're going to try to get to this decision done quickly. I call it the difference between people coming in cold, educated, or vetted, right? Cold is like, I really don't know a lot. You reached out to me. Educate me. Cool. I want to talk to someone. I want to get up to speed. Send me some things where I can play with the demo myself before the call. Great. Then you get me to educated where I'm like, okay, this is a problem I actually might want to think about solving, right? And then when you get to vetted, that's those people that come in and say, I've already talked to your two competitors. I already understand pricing. We're trying to replace here. Here are our requirements. Tell me what you can do for me. And, and we've all been trained to say, let's hop on a call. And the guy's like, listen, no. You know, I'm going through this right now. I won't, I won't mention the company. We've got like 40 free users and six paid users. And he's like, let's hop on a call. I go, no. I go, who's using it on my team? Who, who should I talk to? These people. I, I, I send them an email. I said, hey, tell me, can you guys live without this tool? Would these additional features be helpful? Great. Thank you. Okay, what's the cost for that? Okay, let's hop on. I'm not hopping on a call with you. Stop. Okay. And so I just feel like today's sales process, and, and look, I realize that I'm at like maybe the, the early adopter innovator curve of some of this, but I don't think I'm that far ahead. Meaning again, our consumer behavior is continuing to wire our brains for instant access to information, instant access. There's no barriers, no form fills. It's just boom, boom. You know, if I buy, if I buy something on TikTok, literally it has my, and obviously we can get into that. I can literally buy it in one click one, maybe, you know, maybe two for certain things. And so I think more and more companies need to realize I need to have multiple buyer paths and identify where people are in their educated education and intent level. And so I can put them on their journey, just like marketing has been doing for years on the consumer side. So, so that, that's really what I think is important for any sales leader to say, how do we deal with high intent people? Is there a way we can get those cold buyers to educated before they ever get on the phone with somebody? You know, versus the salesperson being the main way that people learn. And that is what sales has been for a long time. I've heard not only you, as you um, just articulated, but Anthony and Arino both indicate that the buyer journey is no longer linear, uh, like you just said. And, you know, you talked about um, the multiple buyer paths and dealing with high intent people differently. Um, from a recruiting standpoint, I wonder, can you tell us what skill sets might be necessary uh, to adapt to this new reality? So if we're looking at, you know, who we're hiring and what, who we want on the team, um, has that changed? You know, it's interesting. I, I, I don't know if that's changed as much as 
um, the training that we're giving people is, has gotten worse, which is kind of ironic if you think about it. Um, you know, the term consultative selling or, you know, value-based selling, these are not new terms. Um, but, it, but I'll tell you why, and I'll kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll hinge in or, or, you know, hone in on this word, uh, you know, consultative, well, what does a consultant do? Okay. A consultant just listens. Hey, tell me what the problem is. Like, what are you facing? What are you trying to accomplish? They dig deep. They look to understand. And then they say, okay, based on what you told me, here's some areas that, you know, I think could potentially help. And that might be your product, right? It could be your product, et cetera. So I, I don't know if the skill sets have changed, meaning like you, I feel like you have to be, if you're not consultative today, nobody's going to want to talk to you. If you're not able to have a discuss, like a true, like understanding their business. And that's probably this, the second thing. So if you can't be consultative in the questions you ask, nobody wants to talk to you. If you, you aren't an expert in the industries that you sell into, or at least in the buyer personas and what they're going through right now, if you sell into HR, well, man, what's HR trying to do? Well, they're on a hiring freeze. They probably had to let go of some of their own people. Um, and you sell a training platform. Okay, well, hmm, how, how, do I, how do I exist and add value in this complex environment with the economy and layoffs? Well, hmm, well, I know that they're probably going to have to make sure they retain some of their top people, but maybe they care about that less today. They're probably still going to be hiring in certain divisions. Oh, what would those divisions be? Oh, there's probably still hiring engineers maybe. So, okay, so how can I then take my value prop to be relevant toward, look, you probably have, have done some hiring freezes. You may or may not have. And if you have like LinkedIn sales insights, for example, they can tell you if those people are like getting rid of people in certain departments. It's a really good tool. And, and then I can say, look, so maybe you're starting to think about this. How do I, how do I attract and retain my top software developers? You know, and so now my product does that, not it's a training platform from your employees. And if you're a sales rep and you don't get that, if you don't know how to take a product feature set, what you sell and translate it into, a, an, and I don't know if it's empathy or understanding of what your buyer personas, and it could be the decision maker, or the end users, what they're going through. Nobody's going to want to talk to you because you're not adding value to the conversation. You don't get it. And then I've got to go spend however many hours trying to explain it to you. And then I'll just go with somebody else who does get it. So I think it, it, if, if you're not consultative, if you're not obsessed with understanding what your customer is going through right now, then salespeople have a lot less value than they used to. I'm a marketer, as you know, and I'd love for your perspective on um, the marketing side of the equation. So what are the right approaches, do you think, for brands uh, to attract customers and build relationships today in the current environment? Yeah, we've seen this trend for a while now. Um, it's becoming a slightly more difficult to cut through the noise direct is what I would say, slightly more difficult. Again, where, you know, we need to have this education-based content and then this pain point solution based. So I would just say that there's a complexity level today that a lot of marketing teams aren't equipped for to understand. I need to have different types of content for where people are in their intent and education journey. I think so much of marketing content is focused on like, getting people to click and to sign up and not, we're not thinking about, I call it like the near term, the, the, the midterm and the long term nurturing people that we want to get all of those into our pipeline. And do I have different content to help them move through those different stages um, as well? And, and, and along that vein is this concept of, you know, marketing is continuing many times to run the same play as 12 years ago. The, we write eBooks and we chop them into blog posts and then we put links out on social media. Nobody's clicking your links. Go, go run the data, right? A marketing team got mad. I said that their LinkedIn strategy was garbage. And I said, look, prove me wrong. Like prove to me, like I can see who's liking and interacting with your post. It's all your current employees. Nobody's interact. Nobody clicks links. When's the last time anybody listening to this read a complete ebook? Give me a break, right? Maybe you'll click an infographic. I can't, I, I probably have at least three info blog posts, whatever is pulled up right here that I have had open for like three weeks <laughs> that I have not read yet. And, and everyone else, I know, I know you're all nodding your head because you're, you've done the exact same thing. So, so marketing has to be smarter and, and not be so obsessed with a one-to-one -one click attribution to say, you know what's actually probably better? If we start to become the voice and the education in the industry around nurse staffing, and we want to talk about what nurses are going through, how better, how people are doing that versus just putting out a bunch of like eBooks. You know, instead getting your CEO, I think the executive teams today, they are the voice. 
your, your, your individual employees, one of my favorite stats, SAP posts on average, you know, big, obviously massive software company, their company corporate page on LinkedIn posts about 40 times a month, roughly every month over 11,000 SAP employees post. Just think about that. Just think if you could harness the power of educating the market, building community, not just everyone will then click and see they work at SAP. Like they're going to talk about things that are relevant, like in their space. So I, I, there's this, there's this concept that we've got to stop looking for direct one-to-one -one click attribution and realize that more and more marketing, we were, we, we used to believe, believe like heavy, heavy brand. It was brand, brand, brand. Then we got all these tools where we could track stuff. And then it was like, if we can't track it, it doesn't matter. And now we're kind of realizing that the, the truth is somewhere in the middle, that we need to be putting out the types of things that build community and build awareness that then make everyone's life easier, that we might not be able to track one-to-one, -one, but we can look at pipeline contribution over a quarterly period. And we can see our activities increasing our pipeline contribution. And, and I think more and more marketing organizations need to need to start to invest in activities. And I know, and by the way, I know what I'm saying for some marketers is, is really hard because your CFO goes, well, why are we investing in LinkedIn? What's the, the click? It's like, okay, well, it's not all the same thing. So, so I know that what I'm saying isn't the easiest thing at times, but you have to trust your gut. You have to, and it's not even your gut. I mean, like the, the data is there. I can't tell you, we've got a client. Um, we started uh, helping them. We manage their LinkedIn profile and their, their B2B. We do a lot of like outbound optimization. And, and again, we think about this. It's not just the calls to action. It's like, hey, if our CEO is posting organic content, then our sales team is grabbing that, using that to reach out to the peers of that people that commented on it. And now it's making getting indoors. So it's all kind of intertwined. And I think that that's, that's probably the other point is like, this is also intertwined. And, and once you invest in it just a little bit, you'll see results. You know, this come, this client I'm thinking of within the first six weeks of us doing this, they got an inbound from one of their top hundred accounts. And it, the person had DM the CEO directly. And yeah. it's just, yeah. it, it's just a more complex world where the old plays that candidly were just a little easier, where you just produce a book, people download it, you get some names and you hit it. Like, I get it. I wish that that's what worked today. It just doesn't for a lot of industries. There's some industries that still, you know, can operate that way. But for a lot of industries, it's just not working anymore. I want to get you on one other uh, marketing uh, aspect here. And I was hoping you could give me specifics about how a B2B company can remove friction from their buying process. So you, you spoke to this a little bit earlier um, in terms of the new buying process being nonlinear. And are there ways that we can remove friction? Do you have any suggestions? Well, I'll say suggestion one is, is, is a similar point I mentioned before. Of, do you have content that is not necessarily gated? I'll give you a very specific example. And I'll, and I'll use our business. Part of our business is we do fractional sales leadership. So these are usually for either companies that have had leaders transition out or companies that are ramping or a new division or something. So look, there's a whole group of people, we call this global awareness. And these are the group of people that are like, well, whenever we need a sales leader, we go and we hire them and we do this. And there's no way that a fractional leader could blah, blah. Okay. So for those people, we need to just soften them up. They just need content. Like, Hey, did you know that this is a thing? Right? So it's like, what is fractional sales leader? How does it work? So that's like your high level. Then you get into pain point. Hey, have you guys had churn at this? Do you need people who are an expert? And it's a mix of, here's what you need to look for, you know, um, when you're bringing in an outside expert. Like, then there's like, um, let's call it the differentiation content. So when you are now looking for an outside fractional support, you need someone who's not a one-man shop, who understands sales technology as well as sales process, um, and can bring a, not just a, one individual, but the right mix of team members to your um to your company. And that's what we do at Scaled. So you can imagine those are three very different content pillars, right? One is educating on what, like fractional, like we would never do that. Okay, well, let's talk about that. Then the next is, okay, like what are some of the things that you should be, you know, like looking for as a part of this? So I think marketing can just do a better job of, of helping to understand where people are at and putting out content that's relevant based on that. And then the second one is, goes back to what I said, which is the community element that I, I really feel like in B2B marketing today, um, whether you're look, working with third parties, whether you're not, um, to, to help you with a community, can you build community around a topic, around a thing? And you're just adding value with no pitch. And I think that that's like one of the hardest things right now is like, 
you know, um, I figured this out three or four years ago, but um, I didn't used to think this way. I used to be like, if it, you know, if you can't track it, it doesn't matter, right? That's that's the world I was raised in. Um, and then I just start, I just realized like that I've just seen the results. We generate millions, and I'm so we we and I'll just kind of make bring this home for folks. Every year we generate millions of dollars, plural, from organic inbound LinkedIn. These are people that hey Jake, I saw your post, and they the, literally the lead source is Jake's LinkedIn. And then even when it's Google search, it's like Google search. And so um, we're tripling down there. You know, we're tripling. This is organic. And we're getting like the equivalent. If you, if you add up our views, it would be almost the equivalent of if I was paying for the, the amount of views that we get on our posts, like almost a half a million dollars a year of free advertising. Mm -hmm. Free. And, and LinkedIn and TikTok are, you know, two of the best places for that, depending on what you do. Um, but there's, it's just, there's just a new playbook now, Aaron. And, and I, and I wish it was easier and I wish I could tell you to just do simpler things, but you just have got that. Some of these things are just not as trackable as they used to be. And you have to be okay with it and understand that it's going to pay off in three, six, nine, 12, 24 months. And in addition to community led marketing, which you just described, um, another hot topic recently has been, how do you get sales and marketing teams to align better and work together? Uh, look, I'll, I'll tell you, it starts at the top, meaning if marketing is compensated on MQLs and SQLs and sales is compensated on revenue, you, you can't fix the problem, period. If marketing is not tied to revenue and marketing, is, that isn't a main component or, you know, or, qual or, or like qualified pipeline contribution and revenue, you're never going to get alignment because marketing is going to continue to focus on really early stage. And again, they're, they're not leads. <laughs> they're people's names and email addresses. They're not leads. They're not MQLs. A mark, if you count webinars and downloads as MQLs, th that's the behavior I'm talking about. Who cares? Who cares? It's like, now if they do that and visit the pricing page and then they do this and then they click on, on like review a demo, boom, now we're starting to show levels of intent to get us to qualified pipeline. So for me, I think marketing has to be aligned to revenue or some type of like funnel metric uh, that's not so early in the process because it just incentivizes the wrong behaviors if we're focusing on that. Instead, it's like, um, you know, I'm not saying you couldn't work backwards some of the math, sure. But if everyone is focused on, you know, hey, our jobs combined as a team is to make sure we all know who we're targeting what the messaging is to these individuals. That's probably another one is like making sure marketing understands your buyer personas. I mean, I am shocked. You know, you go to a content marketing. Hey, so you sell into VPs of operations and industrial manufacturing. What are the top three trends in industrial manufacturing right now? If your marketing team can't answer that, how can you help? And so I feel like there's, there's a buyer persona alignment. There's an alignment to revenue. And if we all know who we're targeting, we all know what they're going through, um, mm -hmm. then the, the likelihood that we're going to want to work together is much higher. But I think that there's just a lack of trust right now. And again, if, if at the top, tip top marketing is compensated on revenue, the, the leaders at the top are incentivized to work together um, and it eliminates a lot of that natural friction. And then if everyone is really truly aligned on what our buyer, like who our buyer is and what they care about, then I think you can get those two groups aligned. We're heading into 2023 with talks of a looming recession. So I wanted to ask you, how should sales and marketing teams be preparing? What should they be focused on right now? There's two things. You know, what we saw happen in kind of the time leading up to 2020 is more sales in particular, I should say, is so used to like not making changes in real time or not even like a semblance of real time, like, they're updating their sequences every six months to a year. Mm. I mean, just think about that. You've got a team that's pumping hundreds of thousands or millions of data points through a system and they're updating it once a six months. It's crazy. It's really, you know, I, I always use the analogy of Google AdWords. If your marketing team is running $100,000 a month of Google AdWords and the same thing, if you had $100,000 you're spending on SDRs, you're going to spend 10 to 20% of that budget to optimize the spend and conversion rates. Mm -hmm. um, how much do we spend to optimize the conversion rates of our SDRs? Half time of a half time of an SDR leader and a sales ops person who's just not equipped to understand how sequences actually work. Like, so, so the reason I'm bringing that up in terms of what you can do now 
is on the sales side, you have to take a performance management mindset. Whether again, and, and obviously we do a lot of this work, we're Outreach's largest partner, we're, we do a lot of work with Sales Loft um, and other you know folks as well too. Um, and and that's 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 what our rebranding is. It's outbound performance management. <laughs> it's like, who cares about this? Like, you need to understand what's working. Like rewriting the, the messaging in real time. And 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 so what you can do to prepare is start to think about what does my buyer care about, and am I starting to am I starting to build out new sequences and talk tracks? Maybe just having a conversation internally with the team. Hey guys, let, let's just sit down and spend a few hours. If things go south, what's our customer going to go through? How would we change our sequences? Let's go ahead and maybe write a few. Let's go write some of these contingency-based sequences. You know, let's go. So I think that, that, that those are some tactical things. You have to start to switch. And, and by the way, you, you should take the same mindset to your sales process as well, too. If you're a company and you're running 100 demos a month or 200 demos a month, and you're not updating your sales process in quarterly... <laughs> Most people update their methodology every few years. And it's like, why do you want all this data if you're not going to use it to improve? You know, we're so obsessed with all this data and getting new insights, but then we don't even have a mechanism in place to actually improve the processes, nor do we I, I, like want to do it that way. So I think there's this, this, this performance management mindset that, that sales teams have to adopt. Um, and if you can't do it yourself, great. Like that's why I think, again, more sales teams should work with agencies like ours and many, many others is like, and it's the same reason, hey, guess why marketing works with performance agencies, web design agencies, PR agencies? Why do you think they do that? These people are experts. They, that's their, their jam. And, and, a, and half of one person's job is not going to get you the performance management mindset. You need to iterate and get better faster and then start the contingency plan now. So start to think about what some of those things could look like, um, You know what those value props would be, how things would change if the economy goes down. Start talking to your customers. Ask them. Ask your, hey. Hey, Susan, what are you worried about right now? In advance of this interview today, I asked my community to submit their questions, and here's some of the things that they wanted to know. William Stevens asked, how do you convince an outdated executive team to pursue modern sales and marketing approaches, particularly in an environment where they're reacting to immediate revenue shortfalls? So he's talking about buy-in. Yeah. Well, I don't know what William's role is, but I'm going to give two answers here. Okay. One, do whatever you want. Like, I think a lot of reps, I, I don't know what it is. And I'm going to assume maybe he's a sales rep or maybe he's a sales manager. You can just go do whatever you want. Like, if you really believe that there's a better way, just start to test it, dude. Like you work remote. They're not listening to all your calls. They're not doing like, just start to do it. I think a lot of times like people sit and wait for permission. So yeah. one, <clears throat> don't wait, just do it. Nobody's watching probably like 70% of what you're doing. If you are worried about that, then if you go to your leader and you say this, you say, um, hey, Aaron, I, you know, look, I have a couple of ideas of ways that we can improve our demo to close rate by making these four changes to our proposal. I don't think we're doing this. I don't think we're doing this, et cetera. So here's what I'd like to do. I'm going to do everything else identical. For the next five, I'd like to test this and if it works, we can talk about what might, what like, what a broader deployment of that might look like. Does that work for you, Aaron? Hmm. I'm going to do everything else you told me to do. Same thing for cold calling and, and outbound. Hey, look, I have some ideas on how I, I, I really think video could work for us. I get it. We haven't done it a ton. I'm going to continue to hit my call metrics, my email metrics, every metric you need. But I'm also going to test video. And here's what I'd ask. If, if it does work, that we could potentially adjust the work that, that we're doing and have that as a part of it. Are you open to that? Most leaders are going to say yes. Yeah. So, Absolutely. so you, a lot of teams don't make it easy for their leader to say yes to change. They come up with, they come with like ideas as opposed to like, hey, I'm going to do everything you said. I'd like to make these four things. Here's why, here's my data. Here's my, like my imperial evidence of why I think this is going to work. If it doesn't, fine, I'll keep going back to do it. All I want to do is get better. And so yeah. either way, you're kind of like just doing it or you're getting permission to do it. And I think, you know, William, I think you'll be pretty surprised at how many leaders will say yes if you bring them a logical argument. Yeah, and I like your first point because with the sales leaders that I've worked with, they always want to replicate their top sellers and what are they doing and what are those approaches? And if you're one of those people that's doing really well with an approach, I've seen most sales leader, I mean, they want you to pass that along and show others. 
Greg Easthouse uh, wanted to ask, when it comes to funnel responsibilities, do you recommend account executives hunt their own leads or remain focused on demand capture? Demand capture. I'm assuming you mean sales by that. Yeah. Um, it should be both. Meaning what I would say is this, um, you know, my job is if I'm an account executive is to sell business into my territory. It could be a vertical region, whatever it is. Um, within that, and if I have an SDR, great. That person works with me on that, you know, to help me to open it up. There are going to be accounts that most likely are more strategic, that are bigger or more complex that I can't expect someone with 10 less years experience than me to get them up to speed. So I'm going to carve out 10 to 20% of my time focused on strategic networking, building. And not only that, what am I doing? I'm going on LinkedIn. I'm connecting with every single person in the buyer circle. I'm putting out content one, one to two times a week, talking about trends in industrial manufacturing or whatever it ends up being, right? I'm warming them up. I'm warming them up, right? I don't know. Do you count that, count that hunting your own leads? Like, I don't know. Right. Then after I see them comment, boom, then I come in with a DM. Right. So I, I think, yes, you, you need to realize it's your part of your job to do that. Um, and that it's not all going to be handed to you. Cause look at the end of the day. And the other thing is this, it's your quota, Greg, it's your quota. And so if that means my, my SDR is not good, I, I, I'm, he is not going to make me fail. I'm going to tell you that right now. And that means if I've got a bad SDR, I'm going to be working with that SDR manager. And my manager will be like, hey, 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 I need, I need someone else in here. Like, let me tell you why. Here's the results. Here's the, you know, anyway, going back to the same way that you put together an argument. Um, but guess what? Maybe I got to source 80% of my pipeline because my SDR sucks. It is what it is. Or quit and go to find somewhere else. But I'm not going to sit there in seven months and be like, well, my SDR wasn't good. Like, it, it's your success. It's your commission. So, you know, Man, or, you know, man, if you can train your SDR to like do it for you, like and crush it, then great. But I would just not expect that going in. I'd expect that I'm going to need to source a certain amount of my own pipeline. Um, and that if I can get some outside help, great. Um, but I'm not going to be a victim to whatever I'm assigned. Yeah, that's sage advice. You know, Jake, thank you so much for your time today. This conversation has been extremely valuable and um, I appreciate you answering my questions. I love it, man. I love it. Yeah. I really enjoyed the conversation and hope everyone had a, a lot of takeaways as well, too. Awesome.